Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sexuality research methods and challenges. I included another supplemental video next to this that goes a little bit deeper into the research methods and I'll introduce those a little bit in this video but definitely check that one out also. I just wanted to make one that really introduces you to some of the things that we can study in the psychology of sexuality or human sexuality and so that's the purpose of this video. The book opens up talking about the goals of sexology and again what is sexology? The study of sexuality. So again for this class we're going to be taking a psychological approach to the study of sexuality. A sociological approach might focus heavily on culture for example or laws, systems and structures in place that structure our sexual behavior. Psychology is kind of in the middle between biology and sociology. So we're always going to have to consider biological influences that affect not only the structure of the brain, but also how we think, feel, motivation, and all of which encourage or influence our social behavior. And so a biopsychosocial approach is what you're going to be hearing me talking about throughout this class. Again, the next couple of chapters we'll get into the biology of male and female and intersex anatomy, for example, and then how does that influence our sexual behavior, cognitions, emotions? Are there disparities between different biological sexes when it comes to things like arousal? And so it's a little bit challenging because, again, we are in a psychology class, but in order to understand the psychology of sexuality, we have to refer to biological influences and how that, you know, influences the way the brain works, the way we feel and think. And then we also have to think about the social context, which is heavily responsible for socializing norms about sexuality, for example, scripts about dating, um, what's acceptable and what's not, types of relationships, you know, and so we'll get into that also. But again, so that's why this can be a little bit complex because in order to understand the psychology of sexuality, we also have to be delving into all these other fields, including history. Like look at how relationships and sexuality has evolved over time. Back in the day, people didn't cohabitate before marriage, for example, or if you got pregnant, and you weren't married, that was extreme taboo. But now in modern times, over 40% of women get, you know, have a baby when they're not married. There's been some rapid social changes. And so, again, we'll take a little bit of history, biology, psychology, sociology, some philosophy. We'll mix it all into this class. But again, the main for purpose of this lecture is how do we go out and study these factors? How do we go out and study how the body influences the way we think or our attitudes about sexuality or the types of behaviors that we engage in? And so how do we study the influence of cultural norms on our attitudes towards sexuality? You know, things like that. Um, so... It's really interesting stuff, but again, that biopsychosocial approach. So when we go to study it, we have to really cover all of our grounds to explain how phenomena occur. So we're going to be constantly just introducing all of these ideas to understand why do we behave in the way we behave, because that's not a simple answer. So much of your behavior is just unconscious processes. Your body and your unconscious mind are driving you. They're driving the car. You're not even conscious just because you're awake, for example, which is one of my favorite lectures in, you know, like an intro to psychology or consciousness class, right? So again, a lot of what's driving us is unconscious or even biological in nature. We might not even realize it. But again, these neurons have a way of releasing chemicals that have a way of getting us to do what our body wants us to do. And again, is our dr body driving us to engage in sexual relations? I mean, is sexuality, being sexual, part of the human experience? And again, that's why we have to cover it in a human sexuality class. So when we're talking about sexology, again, this is just the study of sexual cognitions, thinking, behavior, attitudes, so again, what is the goal of sexology, the study of sexuality? Are we here to understand sexual behavior? Are we here to predict sexual behavior? Are we here to control or change behavior? Think about it, right? I mean, there are things that humans engage in that are culturally labeled deviant. Like, we'll have to cover some of the sexual philias later in this class, but 
humans and bestiality. That's something we need laws against to protect. Humans and pedophilia. We need to protect children. Humans, unchecked, uncontrolled, are capable of various sexual acts, some of which we culturally label deviant and some of which we culturally label acceptable. And then those attitudes get into our head, we internalize those and those then direct our sexual behavior, for example. Like in modern times, you can't just kiss someone. You literally, you need to ask consent. Like that's kind of, I think where we're at culturally, I'm not saying it's like a permanent rule, but you know, with my son, for example, I've always told him, you have to ask someone if you can kiss them. It's not like back in the day when Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones can be a little bit rough. Because if you look at movies in the 80s, compared to now, like the kind of behavior that was acceptable in the 80s with Indiana Jones is not acceptable in modern times, okay? Are we here to... And so how do we go about studying it? Your book's going to introduce non-experimental versus experimental research and also quantitative versus qualitative research, which I'll delve, you, I'll delve into here in a second. We're also going to focus on things like how do we sample populations to be able to get at our goals? How do we operationalize and measure variables? Um, how do we gather data? What are the ethical issues concerned with? studying sexuality, and then looking at the reliability and validity of studies, which we'll cover a little bit. I did put a much longer lecture video on all this, so hopefully this is just a quick refresher of some of these things. Um, but yeah, this kind of stuff is important because generally with college, you always have to take a research methods class to get out. So you'll get into all the different types of sampling, the different types of methods, and all of that. I'm going to go over that shortly. Um, but just, you know, get you thinking about why we're studying it in the first place. So when it comes to experimental versus non-experimental methods, um, in order for something to be an experimental method, it requires three things, which is having a representative sample, a random sample. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, they require uh, manipulation of the variables, randomization when it comes to sampling, which means everybody's randomly aside and then having a comparison or a control group. However, it's very hard to study social behavior in experimental ways. So I'm gonna bring up my chart here in a second just to introduce you to several of the different types of methods. And again, my other lecture video goes much deeper into each one of these. Um, but when we're looking at experimental versus ex non-experimental methods, Experiments generally are quantitative, numerical, and then they require, again, manipulation, randomization, and comparison to control group. Non-experimentals, things like surveys, phenomenological or ethnographical research, which I'll introduce you to in a second. Those are types of qualitative research. Um, the goal of quantitative research is to look for statistical significance. And that can be done with qualitative research also, but, you know, qualitative is definitely looking at more open-ended types of questions and then finding common themes, which I'll introduce to all this in a second. But just a couple words like independent versus of dependent variables. I always think of the independent variables, the thing that causes the change in the dependent variable, and then we measure whether the dependent variable was affected by the independent variable. Um, so I'll introduce you to those really quick. So if you guys, just not to bore you with all the research methods, because again, you guys are going to get a lot of it. But so when we're talking about experimental different types of methods, again, we're going to be looking at does it have randomization, manipulation, and a comparison or a control group. So for example, your book introduces things like case studies, right? Um, or single case experimental studies. When behavior of a single participant is observed and it's, their own control. Um, so we can also look at things like reversal or ABA. You have a baseline, a treatment, and then you measure it again. Multiple baselines are, you know, or, you know, so I don't want to bore you with all of this stuff, but there are, these are all just different types of experimental methods, okay? Changing criterion between subjects, within subjects. And you guys don't need all of this right now. It's a sophomore level class. Um, but again, just to show you factorial experimental designs, there are so many experimental designs that are generally quantitative in nature, okay? Then you have other types of designs like a quasi-experimental, 
one group post test only or one shot case study and then there's just all these different types of quasi experimental ones longitudinal studies cross sectional studies it's all just completely complex so I put up another uh, PowerPoint lecture just to go over that for you in case you need all the different types of methods but again this one I wanted to just cater specifically to like what are some of the ideas that we're going to be addressing what can we study in the psychology of sexuality what are some good ideas for studies um, and so if you want the much more in-depth quantitative qualitative experimental versus all the different types of experimental quasi experimental and qualitative research like surveys naturalistic observation whatever it might be again i put all of that in the other lecture video for you the book does talk about some large studies one of the first studies on sexuality was the kinsey reports that examine male and female sexual behavior since then we've done some more national level reports like the national health and social life survey which uh, examines sexual attitudes and behaviors National Survey of Sexual Health and Behavior, which looks at sexual acts, condom use, same-sex relations, etc. These are interesting. If you guys are interested in doing something like what are some past studies on the psychology of sexuality for a final project, that would be an excellent idea. Again, what can we study in this class, though? And this is really the heart of what I wanted to introduce you to. Again, just a quick refresher. Quantitative is numerical data. Qualitative is non-numerical data. Experimental requires representative sample, control group, and manipulation of variables. And then you can have mixed method studies, which is a blend of some quantitative data and qualitative data. Qualitative data is generally open-ended, things along those lines. But again, that's all in the last one. But what can we use these different types of methods to study? For example, can a person's sexual orientation change over time? How does biology influence sexual behavior? How is biological sex specifically associated with sexuality? Are there disparities between sexes? How often do people think about sex? And we can measure that quantitatively by asking them to fill out a survey that they circle, you know, I think about it seven times a day, and then we can quantitatively do that. Or we can go out and ask them open-ended questions in a qualitative survey, like how often do people think about sex? What, how, what do you think about when you're thinking about sex? What are your fantasies about sex? You know, what kind of types of behavior do you engage in sexually? Example, how do we measure arousal? You know, how do we measure physical processes versus emotional processes, for example? Are men more interested in casual sex than women? There's some fascinating studies on that in psychology where they've gone to college campuses, for example, and they'll just have like a woman who's called a confederate in the study go up and pretty much offer sex and it's something like nine out of ten men accept it and i think it's pretty high for women it's like six out of ten for women too so that's an interesting study that's been done what causes sexual assault why is violence built into humanity and why does humans use violence for sexual purposes which is a dark conversation first time i ever heard that lecture was from a yale psychology professor talking about why humans engage in violent sexual abusive behavior and it was a really dark but again you have to look at humanity and ask what are we capable of do we need social controls you know one out of three women experience some form of sexual abuse in their lifetime i mean one out of three so you're talking about you know a billion people on this planet have experienced that what does that tell you about humans and how we you know Again, it's a dark set. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You guys do have a chapter on it. Uh, it is chapter... It's a little bit later. I have to find it. Oh, 17, sexual coercion. 18, sex for sale. Um, yeah, so... There's a little bit of darkness in this class that's always hard to talk about. Uh, what are commonly transmitted STDs? How do we track them? How do we prevent them? What's the average penis size? These are all from your book. What are characteristics of long and short-term relationships? I like, there's some awesome studies about what happens, I mean, who gets more brain rewards? People in long-term studies or short-term relationships. And what you find that the brain rewards of being in these long-term, intimate, committed, romantic relationships just have incredible amounts of brain rewards so there's a lot of arguments for monogamy but humans are also capable of engaging in 
you know, non-monogamy in various ways. And we have reward systems built into our brain for both of those processes. And so it's just interesting. I One of my favorite studies is on that. Is pornography helpful or harmful? Does it reduce violence against women? Does it subjugate women to coercion? You know, and so there's these back and forth discussions about that. What is gender identity compared to sexual identity and are they related? You know, because gender identity and sexual identity are separate concepts, but are they interrelated? Does your gender identity influence or infer your sexual orientation, for example, is a really interesting question. How do you talk to a partner about sex? I mean, in your relationships, culturally, you know, do you grow up in a place where talking about sex is normal or talking about sex is taboo or somewhere in between? You know, and again, it can be very helpful to relationships to be able to discuss your sexual relations, how's it's going, what we can do better, etc., to maybe improve relationships. Because again, is sex associated with divorce, for example? And there's, when I teach in my marriage and family class, I mean, those are factors, you know, because again, what are the triangular theory of love? You know, you have intimacy, commitment, and romance. And so, do you have all of three of those? Then you're probably in. A sexual relationship if you just have intimacy and commitment but no romance that's probably your best friend you know what i mean so i'll bring that up a little bit later in this class how do you talk to teens about sex and again that can be a taboo and a hard conversation do you just come out with all the truths or do you hold back and express some conservatism when you're talking about that and then how does culture influence our attitudes about sexual education for example um, how common are sexual kinks or fetishes? Your book asks the question. And then again, how would you study all of these things? How do you study a person's sexual orientation over time? We can go out and ask surveys. We can go out and do interviews. We can, you know, uh, do a longitudinal study where we survey somebody at five years, 10 years, 20 years, and see if there's been any change. How do we study arousal? Again, we can stick a bunch of electrodes on our head and see what parts of the brain are being activated. We can test physiological changes in our body, you know, just by using medical instruments. And so there's been tons of studies on that. Like they will have a bunch of men stare at someone who is naked and study arousal and then do the same thing with women. And then they'll look at where are their eyes going? Who... Are men more attracted to certain parts of bodies and women more attracted to other parts of bodies? And you're going to find there's some disparity there. Why? Again, how much of that's biology? Why are women more interested in a chest versus men being interested in a breast? Again, it's how much of that's influenced by your biology, your predetermined behaviors and cognitions. And I'm not saying all your behavior is deterministic in nature. But your body is determining a lot of your behavior. It's driving you. It's pushing you, right? And so, again, um, for this, I just started going through a lot of my files. And I have just articles upon articles about sexuality. But these are just some examples of what things people have studied. This one looks at relationship quality along different types of romantic partners and polyamorous and mon monogamous relationships and ask, is there a significant difference in relationship quality between monogamous people and non-monogamous people? This one's looking at sexual fluidity and how it's evolved over time. Um, this one is looking at a pregnant woman. And it turns out that she has both male and female chromosomes yet she is having babies. How does that work? Intersex, it's complex. Um, this one is about what kind of words are college students using in modern times. And it's very diverse. Like there are so many words and categories for sexual orientations and genders that even as a sociology and psychology professor, it is so hard for me to keep up because they're just constantly reconstructing and deconstructing and constructing sexual identity and gender identity vocabulary. This one looks at how we historically used to pathologize or we would label deviant or we would label um, psychological disorders for people that did not identify as heterosexual. And how has our attitudes changed over time? This one's up here 
is looking at rural versus non-rural differences in psychosocial risk factors among sexual minorities. And it asks, are teens that are sexual minorities better off, worse off, the same when it comes to health as people in urban areas? And what you're going to find is that higher levels of stigma in rural areas, less access to culturally competent health care creates disparities in groups between sexual minorities that live in the city versus those that live in the country. This one is looking at homophobia across countries and then asking how does that affect public health policy and the health in general of people. And again, our cultural social attitudes influence our attitudes toward healthcare, laws, policies, etc. This one asks about religion and sexual identity and has there been some kind of an evolution in our attitudes from the religious groups and organizations over sexual identity. This one's looking at heteronormativity. And again, heteronormativity is looking at attitudes that think, you know, heterosexuality is superior to non-heterosexuality and that we impose heterosexual cultural attitudes upon society through the socialization process. And is that still occurring? This one's looking at ethical issues when it comes to how do we study um, sexual minorities of diverse ages. And again, that's a big concern. We always have to keep ethics in the, in the forefront of our brain. This one, again, is looking at sexuality in the 21st century and sexual fluidity. And again, how has that evolved over time? Do we have a continuum theory of sexual orientation that we all range from somewhere between straight and gay? Or is it more complex like than that, like sexual configurations theory that your identities are more like galaxies in the universe, that they're not really a continuum from one to the other, but they're all subtly interconnected through gravitational pull, for example, <laughs> which is a little more complex. But again, this is just a quick introduction to things that we can study, you know, sexology, what can you study when it comes to sexuality? It is incredibly broad. We can, like my dissertation for my PhD was on the stigma experienced by sexual minorities, specifically Hispanic, Latinx, gay, lesbian, gender, non-conforming uh, minorities, um, and then how are they infected by laws, policies, and social attitudes, which is called structural stigma. And um, so, but again, you, as you can see, we can go and study so many different things. Just if it's related to human sexuality, if it's related to the way we think, feel, our motivation toward the social context, biological influences related to sexuality, we can find a way to study it. But again, we need to come up with a good method quantitative or qualitative, and then decide the type of method. Is it going to be experimental, quasi-experimental, naturalistic observation, ethnographic observation, um, interviews, whatever it might be to get at that data, uh, secondary data like prior studies that have already been done and then consolidating those to create theories or whatever it might be. Um, you need to be aware that all these diverse methods exist. Again, watch the other lecture video to go a little bit deeper into all of them, but there are just so many methods. I don't want to crush you with that, you know, sophomore year of college. Just a quick introduction. Be aware of those vocabulary like independent versus dependent variable, uh, randomization, manipulation, control, um, different types of methods, whatever it might be. So again, thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.